Good morning. Can I welcome everyone to the fourth meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2019 and remind everyone present to turn off their mobile phones. Agenda item one is consideration of whether to take agenda item seven in private. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. Thank you. Agenda item two is consideration of the Scottish Housing Regulator's annual report and accounts for 2017-18. And I welcome from the Scottish Housing Regulator, George Walker, the Chair, and Michael Cameron, the Chief Executive. And I invite the Chair to make some brief opening remarks. Thank you, Mr Dornan. Uh, well, convener, vice convener and committee, thank you very much for inviting us uh, this morning to present the Regulator's annual report and accounts for 2017-18. I'll, I'll make some remarks uh, to begin with, and um, we're very pleased to take any questions that you have about our annual report, of course, but I'll touch on three important things from that report and indeed from our current work, which I'm sure you, you'll have some uh, thoughts on too. First, I think it's important that I draw to your attention that RSLs and local authorities uh, continue to perform well against the Charter Standards and Outcomes. Now, in August last year, we published our fifth national analysis, as you'll likely know. We found that landlords again continue to perform well in the service areas that tenants tell us matter to them most. And so the good news uh, from that analysis uh, is that um, tenant satisfaction now sits at over 90%. So I think we'd, we'd all think that's a pretty good outcome. Um, that is due in no small part, I need to say, to the tireless work that's done by many of the voluntary governing body members who work tirelessly to help achieve that outcome for tenants. And they, they're to be congratulated for that, of course. Secondly, um, I want to acknowledge to you that we've again had to use our statutory intervention powers in the past year. To set that in a wee bit of context, since 2012, um, we've um, intervened in 12 uh, cases uh, uh, with RSLs. Um, and we did that to protect the uh, interests of tenants of those uh, landlords. Last year, we took some time uh, to, to think and reflect, and we published a lessons learned report on, on our early interventions. And the, what that really highlighted was that the failures that led to interventions kind of serious implications for RSLs, including potentially significant costs involved. And we're mindful of that. But that makes it all the more critically important now that governing bodies really do assure themselves that their landlords are well run, that the landlord focuses on the right things, manages risk, and delivers good services at a price that their tenants can afford. And in doing that, that will help to avoid them getting into a position where the regulator needs to intervene. Now, the main thrust of the changes in our new regulatory framework that um, is in particular around self-assurance, is aimed at getting landlords to do just that. And that takes me on to my third thing that I'd like to touch on, and that is our new regulatory framework. As the committee, I, I think, may well know, we're coming to the end of a major consultation on this framework. Um, through this, we're promoting a culture of assurance, openness and transparency uh, right across the sector, and as I've mentioned earlier, our approach in the new framework is to aim to support landlords to be well run and deliver what tenants, people who are homeless and other service users need and want. Now, to be clear uh, to the committee, our statutory objective and our functions haven't changed, but what we are doing is refreshing the tools that, that we use to, to regulate. The new framework will be the culmination of a year-long um, process and discussion that we've been having with tenants, landlords, representative bodies and, and of course, funders. We've had uh, good feedback and, and lots of engaging discussion uh, through the, that uh, consultation. Uh, we've had roundtable events right across the country, including 10 uh, for tenants. And it's been, for us, it's been a very inclusive and highly worthwhile listening process. Um, consultation closed in, on 14th of December, as you might know. We plan to publish the new regulatory, frame, regulatory framework sorry, and guidance by the end of February, with the new framework coming into to being from uh, April uh, this year. Um, so sitting alongside that new framework, we've proposed something that we think is interesting and important, and that is that we have proposed working with the sector uh, to develop what we're calling an advisory toolkit to support landlords and in particular governing body members 
to ask the right questions, make sure their governance is and the assurance they get is as good as it can be. And if you like, that's really all about supporting uh, responsible landlords to do the right things for their tenants, uh, those who are homeless and, and other service users. Now, I'm pleased to say to you that the first cut analysis of that co the consultation responses show a very broad support for the new framework proposals. Um, we will publish an independent review of the consultation responses by the end of February. And if you're at all interested in, in what those responses have been, the 90 or so that we've received are, are already live on our, our website. Um, as you'll know, a key role for us is helping to create an environment where lenders are confident to invest in an RSL. That flow of, of um, uh, money is important. And I'll wrap up in just one minute, uh, Mr. Donnan. Uh, is, is that OK? Um, uh, so we were very pleased, therefore, in an engagement and the feedback from UK Finance, the representative body uh, of lenders, um, who said in their uh, response to the consultation that funders to Scottish RSLs take great comfort from the current approach of the Scottish Housing Regulator, which is risk-based and proportionate. And in fact, it is that that leads to what they would suggest is, is up to £40 million worth of annual savings and interest payments a year to Scottish RSLs. Finally, and, and I'll wrap up uh, to, keep, to keep it brief, um, we're very grateful for the uplift we've received in our funding uh, th this year, uh, for uh, sorry, 2018 uh, 2019 20, and that certainly will help us implement the new regulatory framework. However, I do need to say to you that we're encountering real frustration around the pace of recruitment and the increasing demands that we see coming our way. My board is concerned um, about our capacity to keep responding to new areas of work um, or problem regulatory cases that, that might arise as a result of that. So, convener, I, I, I realise time's, time's short, so I don't wish to hog the floor. Um, I'll happily hand back to yourself and we'll answer any questions that you have for us. Thank you Thanks very, very much, much, Mr Walker. Uh, Andy, you wanted to come in? in <coughs> yes, thanks very much, uh, uh, Convener, and thank you uh, for coming along this morning. Um, you said something about your new regulatory framework that you're going to be um, introducing later uh, this year. Can you just say a little bit more about what outcome you intend to achieve, uh, you, 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 you think will be achieved by that, and what is most likely to, to change, possibly from your perspective, but perhaps also from a housing association or tenant perspective? It, it, it's a very good question because we put a lot of thought into what we had learned from past experience over the last five, the last five years uh, into how we propose that framework, uh, Mr Whiteman. And so really what we were looking to achieve is a, a high level focus on getting assurance, open and, and openness and transparency across providers and of course enhancing that from ourselves too. Um, in particular, we're looking to support those boards that, that they, uh, boards and governing body members, I should say, sorry, they call themselves different things. We're looking to support them in getting the levels of assurance that they need from their uh, management teams, that the individual landlords are doing the right things, managing risk, and, and some of the things I talked about earlier, I talked about earlier. Why is that? Well, that is about the fact that in the cases where we have had to intervene, and indeed our lessons learned report demonstrated this, that in the main those interventions have been around governance failures, and in some case and in some cases financial failures as well. And so you can see the theme that therefore runs through that. And one of the key elements of it that um, I'll maybe get Michael to comment on a little more if you would like, is a move towards annual self-assurance statements. And the annual self-assurance statements are statements that would be signed off by the governing bodies and the chairs of boards um, to give them, if you like, I've used the language in, in, the, in many of the roundtables, this, you know, to give them permission um, to make sure that they, they, they feel able and comfortable asking the questions and asking for the assurance that they need 
from uh, management teams. And those annual self-assurance statements are really all about self-identification of where a governing body um, is compliant with the standards, but also identifying maybe areas where they fall short and, uh, and helping them to uh, plan for that. Now, there are other elements, of course, to the, to the statutory framework, but um, that's the high-level aim that we're looking for. In a perfect world, and it will take time, of course, if we can work effectively uh, alongside governing bodies with a toolkit I touched on in my, in my, opening, st uh, in my opening statement, um, we really like to see the cases of intervention around governance fall, but we recognise that will take time. Michael, I don't know if you'd add anything... I think the only the only thing to add there is is around the specific new requirements that we are um, going to be introduced. So George has touched on uh, the requirement on landlords, that's both local authorities and RSL landlords, to provide us with an annual assurance statement, uh, which is their governing body or committee, relevant committee of the local authority, um, confirming that they are assured that they are meeting all of the regulatory requirements and the standards uh, that are applicable. Um, we will also produce an engagement plan um, for every landlord uh, and we'll publish that engagement plan setting out exactly um, what we will um, expect of each landlord and what we will do um, uh, with each landlord. Now, for the, the, the bulk of landlords, that might be um, nothing more than a requirement to provide us with the normal statutory um, uh, returns, but it's a, a, an important way for us um, to contribute to the transparency um, that, that, that George has touched on. And the final, uh, probably major change that we're looking to introduce will be a regulatory status for every RSL that will set out our view of, of that RSL in terms of its the level of compliance it has with the regulatory requirements and the standards of governance and financial management. Okay, that's helpful. I think, I think last year I was asking you questions about um, what evidence you have that tenants are using the charter to effectively hold housing associations to an account. And you said that governance failures is the principal reason why problems arise. Uh, that's good. I want to also return to a question I raised last year, which is about tenant participation in housing associations. Um, and so we have housing associations like Castle Rock, Edinburgh, that has 6,247 <coughs> units. Um, there's only 169 tenants are members of it. Um, that dropped to 145 this year. Only 18 turned up to the AGM. Sanctuary Scotland Housing Association, 6,600 units. Four people attended the AGM. Uh, Rural Stirling Housing Association, 561 units. 270 members, that's good, and 37 at the AGM. Now, as I understand it, housing associations are not in law required that uh, to have to, to 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 facilitate their tenants being actual members, though in practice many are through limited companies with no share capital and registered societies. Obviously, local authorities you can't have that relationship. But in, ten, in terms of improving governance, how important is it to increase the legal participation of the tenants themselves to be able to hold the housing association to account and for them effectively? to be able to drive through the kind of governance changes that would help ensure that we don't have uh, failures. Mm. Um, at, at a high level, what I would say to you is we use the term tenant voice, mm -hmm. and we think the term, that, that tenant voice is really important, and indeed that's been you know, uh, in the forefront of our mind, and you'd see it peppered through the, the proposed regulatory framework. Um, and partly because of that, because we also wanted to listen to tenants, and I'll come into your specific point, um, is that, as I said, we did 10 tenant events on the consultation right across Scotland, from Lerick to Stornoway to Moffat, uh, and I think major cities in between, to really listen to what tenants were looking for in the new framework, so of course that seemed like a sensible place to start. So I suppose the short answer to your question is we think it's very important that, that um, tenant voice is heard. Um, one thing that came through strongly in that consultation was that tenants really liked the idea of annual assurance statements. 
Um, a number of them said to us in those roundtable meetings, uh, which, by the way, board members were at all of those, including Michael and I, um, one of the things they said was that it can be quite difficult to engage with the ARC, the annual return of data. There's a lot of stuff in that, and even scrutiny committees who review that uh, for tenants, it, it can just be overwhelming, but actually getting involved and engaged with annual assurance statements and seeing that w was, was um, something tenants really welcomed. As to um, engaging with tenants across the board, that's something we encourage. You're right, it's not set out in statute. And of course, there are different set up, there are different corporate structures of different uh, bodies, uh, different RSLs, and some don't require memberships and some do. Um, but we work very hard to encourage that level uh, of engagement. There is something, though, that says that there are times when tenants are perfectly happy with the services they're getting, and, and unfortunately, they, they choose not to engage. And we've seen some examples of that. But that's not to say that we don't think it's very important that that, that should be encouraged. And it is something I probably bore RSLs to death at conferences and where I talk, because they, I, I talk so much about tenant voice. So it's very important to us that that, that that is there and that's why it's in the framework. Michael, I don't know if you'd add anything in, in particular about the legislative aspect of that. I, I think not, not, not specifically around the legislative aspect. I, I think um, it's clearly important that landlords give um, tenants that are interested to um, participate in decision making those those opportunities yeah. I think where there has been um, success uh, in the sector has been the development of tenant scrutiny panels um, which is 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 a formal structured approach for for tenants to um, look at the landlord performance engage with the landlord to identify ways um, to drive improvement uh, and we have um, um, been able to see that that has generated quite a bit of interest from tenants to participate in that way uh, rather than necessarily in the more formal governance structures although as I say it is important that, that, that landlords provide tenants with opportunities to do so okay just finally I mean I have I have you know an example a constituent who I won't name names but um, their uh, housing association has insisted that they make changes to the way they manage the property that they all live in um, and this is based on a, an interpretation a new interpretation of the Scottish secure tenancy <coughs> and one of the tenants went to the AGM and the housing association is kind of so remote that they just got brushed off so what I'm worried about is that if we need to improve governance and we always need to improve governance governance won't be improved in an environment where the stakeholders, and I don't like that word, but the tenants themselves do not have the opportunity to have an effective voice to challenge, to, 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 uh, uh, to explore, to inquire, um, to contribute to new strategies and all the rest of it. So it's not really a question for you because you're a regulator, I understand that, but you've put your finger on governance failures. So governance failures in any sector, energy, whatever, all have broadly similar things you can do to make them better. Um, so it's not really a question, I just... I have a comment, if you like, yeah. and I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think that that's absolutely right. That ability to listen and hear um, from tenants. And indeed, we talk about, I, I think it's. It, I think there's even language, about, I know there's even language about it in, in the new framework. We talk about the use of complaints and complaints as being an opportunity for um, for management teams and governing bodies to hear from and listen to uh, their tenants and see themes. And so what you're talking about, in effect, is a complaint that sounds like that that was um, maybe not, not heard as well as it could be. So I think we would agree with that point of view, and it's why we... Uh, talk about this issue in in great detail a lot of the time. Uh, as, as a matter of, uh, as an example of that will be myself and another board member are jointly running in speak a session and speaking at the SFHA's chairs conference on Friday this week. And that will be quite a big theme of what we're talking about, is that engagement piece, tenant voice, and how that relates to the new framework that we're proposing. So I, I agree with you, and it's certainly something that is very front and centre um, of uh, the regulators thinking. Indeed, it's why we currently have a tenant on our board and we're going through a recruitment pro board recruitment process um, uh, at the moment and uh, we will uh, add to that board uh, so that we have um, strong tenant voice on our own board. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Graham.
Thanks, uh, thanks, convener. Um, it was a big thing when you s step in uh, to, to a housing association, um, and when that happens, there are costs involved, and we need to ensure that there's value for money. Um, we've had a submission. I don't know if you've seen it from the Glasgow and West of Scotland Forum of Housing Associations. We have seen that. You've, yes, you've seen no, that. Mr. And so they express concerns uh, about the costs that are passed on to housing associations when, when you when you step in, um, and they describe some of the costs as as crippling. That's their their word. Um, they talk about uh, consultants being brought in. Um, they're, they're saying there should be greater transparency over the daily rate of consultants. Um, they highlight one case at Wellhouse. Housing Association, uh, where there were direct costs of £222,000 from the statutory manager spanning three financial years, but it only has 800 ten tenancies. Um, and there was another case, they don't name the Housing Association, but <coughs> one with only 330 tenancies, um, where the, the, the cost was £750,000. Um, at the end of the day, it's tenants that could be pay the bill. <coughs> Is there any, yeah? How what what do you do to try and keep these costs down? Where is the transparency? Because I had a look when I read about uh, you bringing in consultants. I thought well, it must be easy to find out who who they've appointed and what they're paying them. I couldn't find that information anywhere. Where is that information? Who have you appointed? What have you paid them? OK, let, let, let me start with that, if I can, uh, Mr Simpson, and I'll, I'll maybe get Michael to pick up um, on some of the specifics for you too, because I think it's an important question. And um, we, indeed, we've met with the forum on this as recently as December, I think it was. Michael, Michael and I sat with them, uh, their chair and, and director, um, discussing this. I suppose what pleased us in, in, in this, this issue they've raised is they're certainly not um, raising concerns about the importance of robust regulation and, and, and at times that they need to, to intervene. Indeed, I think even in their, their, their submission to yourselves, they, they, they made that point that actually they're, they're not questioning those needs for intervention. The costs of that are not lost on us. And that's why we would prefer not to intervene where we can. Uh, but equally, Parliament has given us some powers. Uh, and and the responsibility to protect the interests of tenants, homelessness, those who may become homeless, and and, and other service users, and, and and that's what we what we try to do. We see intervention as the last resort. And in a minute, I'll maybe get Michael to talk about what runs up to that, because I think that that gets lost in this a little bit. Um, uh, for that, so we work very hard to make sure that a lot has happened before we reach the point of inter of intervention. And we do see ourselves as a, as a strong, robust, but proportionate regulator. And what is interesting, I made reference in my opening statement to the fact that the lenders tell us that based on their levels of comfort with the regulatory approach in Scotland, that saves an interest cost about £40 million, £40 million a year to RSLs. We get that there's a flip side to that that where one does step in and, and intervene, that there are costs associated with that. Indeed, the forum talks about um, uh, increased interest rate costs, so there are two sides to that. For us, the reason we've proposed the framework that we have, and I won't rehearse my answer, or re rehearse my answer to Mr Whiteman and what we're trying to achieve with that, <coughs> is if we can get governing bodies really assuring themselves, really digging into this, um, and governance to an even higher level than it is in those few cases where, we, where we, we've had to intervene, then we very much believe that those cases of, of intervention should fall. Because the best way to avoid the costs involved with that, and we're very aware of the costs, we discuss it at our board and, and, and we've, we've published it uh, in, in reports, um, the best way to avoid that is to engage with the regulator at an early stage, um, to sort out issues before it comes to an intervention, and indeed if it does come to an intervention, to engage properly with that so that we can bring that to a conclusion quite quickly. So I suppose overarching in that, what I'm trying to say to you is that the costs of intervening are not lost on us, but of course the cost of a catastrophic failure or an RSL going, uh, going broke, which is one of the things we of course want to avoid, would be significant too. Michael, maybe you'd like to comment on some of that, some of the specifics, and maybe in particular the the work that happens and 
I don't know, is maybe invisible, if that's the right word, yeah, I, I, before I think, intervention? I think it's it's important to set out how we operate as a regulator. And in the first instance, we will engage with a landlord where we've identified or, or it's been brought to our attention that there are um, significant issues. Uh, and we'll look for that landlord to um, improve um, uh, on those issues uh, without us having to use our statutory intervention powers. And it's only where we um, judge that uh, the, the landlord is either unable or unwilling to address the issues um, that we uh, think it would then be appropriate to use our intervention powers. So I think, as George has said, that's very much a last resort. Um, and with the, the, the in, in, in almost all of the, the statutory interventions we've had to date, there's been a significant engagement with the landlord um, prior to us um, starting to use our <coughs> intervention powers. Um, very much a last resort, as Joe says. It, it, we are aware um, that there, uh, there can be costs um, to the organisation as a consequence of statutory intervention, although I'm always um, kind of... Um, brought back to the uh, the quote from uh, an organisation that has been through a uh, statutory intervention where they pointed out that the costs weren't the cost of intervention but the cost of putting things right. Uh, and I think that's important to bear that in mind too. Yeah, look, no, nobody's questioning your your um, right, of course, to, to step in and do things. The question was around uh, transparency. Um, I don't think you really answered that. Um, yeah, we've got a submission that says the the costs of bringing in statutory managers, which you've got to do, can be crippling. So, so what I'm trying to find out is where is it? Where is the information on who you've appointed? I mean, we've got you know some evidence here that you, you're bringing up people from the south of England. There's uh, the cost of flights, uh, accommodation. Where can we find out who you've appointed? why you've appointed them, what uh, scores uh, were used to, um, so, you know, what weightings were given to various factors to, uh, in that process. Um, where, where is it? I can't, I can't find it. Okay. And there's, there's two things I'd say to that. The first one is that when we conclude uh, a statutory intervention, we publish a report on that intervention. And within that report, we set out the direct costs of the statutory intervention, including the costs of, of, of any statutory appointees. And the figures you quoted on two um, um, organisations are figures that are drawn from those published reports. Um, in terms of uh, who we appoint, we have a published list of statutory managers, which we have put in place through an open selection process. Um, now, I think it's safe to say that, that um, the, the market for that type of um, person with the, the skills and experience uh, that are necessary is, is more developed at the UK level. And so at a level, it's not surprising that a number of those who were successful through that open selection process um, came from out with Scotland. Um, uh, there are, there are um, people from within Scotland that we use as well. Um, so it's about us having available to us the, the right people with the right skills. Um, we will be rerunning that exercise in the coming year. Um, and that's an opportunity for uh, anyone else within Scotland who has the uh, necessary skills and experience um, to uh, to apply. And within that um, um, publication around statutory managers, we set out the day rates that, that each uh, individual um, uh, works to. So where, where is this list? This is all published on our website. We can make sure that we get the, the appropriate link sent to you. It's certainly not easy to find. Uh, uh, we'll do two things then, uh, Mr Simpson. We'll make sure we get that information to you. And um, we'd certainly accept that the... Um, the, the user experience through our website could be better, uh, if, if I'm honest with you. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of, it's looking a wee bit dated now and we accept that, it, you know, whilst, uh, you know, our staff can point to a place to get it. And indeed, we've got a process under underway now alongside our framework review to revamp that website and therefore make things, the, the, the user journey, much more visible um, to that. We'll take on board your point, though. It's a perfectly fair one um, about raising the visibility of that, but also we'll get that information to the committee and yourself if, if you'd like to have it. Okay. Um, um, so one, one more question on, the, on, on this. Um, the, the letter also says, it, well, urges you to consider 
alternatives to statutory reaction. Um, have have you done that? Are you able to do that? I, I as as um, uh, George has said out already, um, that's actually how we work at the moment. Um, the and, and we've had this conversation uh, with the Glasgow and West of Scotland Forum uh, that the type of things that they were suggesting we might want to consider actually what we do just now. Um, we, ha as George has said, we've used our statutory intervention powers in 12 um, RSLs um, since 2014, but we've actually had um, significant levels of engagements with more um, than that um, through a non-statutory route. But the key thing here is um, that judgment we have to make about the organisation's willingness and capacity to address the issues that need to be addressed. Um, that's 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 the, the the onus that is on us uh, to make that judgment. Uh, and when we judge that the organisation isn't able or willing, and the issue is of such significant importance, that's when we would uh, look to use our statutory intervention powers. Thank you. Uh, there's a couple of short interventions. Yeah, it's convenient. It was to follow on from what Graham was saying and from some of the responses we've received already. I mean, the, the issue of transparency obviously is quite uh, significant in the document that we received. And I mean, you basically, in response to, to, to Graham Simpson talking about, you know, um, the issue raised of uh, uh, flight and accommodation costs. I mean, you know, most housing associations in Scotland are very well run. So why is it difficult to find the kind of right people, the right uh, skills here in Scotland, given the fact that you know, the tenants will have to pay these extra flight and accommodation costs on top of the, the, uh, any consultancy fees, which I imagine would be higher for people being flown up than people uh, here in uh, Scotland. Um, I'm just wondering if you can respond to that. And just um, the other issue, of course, which is related to this, of course, is that the Glasgow and West of Scotland Forum have said, and I quote, it's generally acknowledged that SHR's use of statutory powers has been very necessary in the great majority of cases, but they then go on to say later in paragraph 4.7, that was 3.2, they say whether the statutory action was necessary in view of alternative remedial plan proposed by the association. So there's a dispute about, and what happens in a case where there is that dispute? You know, do you just basically say, well, in our view, we have to take action regardless of what the association thinks? Because what we're talking about, again, in 4.7, an ongoing case where 800 tenants will be will be burdened with an additional 2.6 million over the next decade because of a low interest uh, loan has been repriced by the lender after statutory action. In in terms of that, you know, um, people flying up or, or people in Scotland uh, it being the case, uh, you're right. The the majority you made the point. You know, the majority of of um, housing associations are well run. We agree with that. The majority are well run. There is an issue, though, with the size of the, the number of bodies in Scotland and the experience around to do it. Because, of course, if you are currently, I don't know, to take an example, if you're currently the chief executive or the director of a well-run housing association, uh, you may well have the skills um, to go in and help another association or be the statutory manager, as we would call it, to do that. But, of course, you also have a full-time job. And so there's something about, about that push and pull. And that's why Michael talked about there be that marketplace being a bit more developed UK-wide uh, than, than Scotland-wide. Uh, and indeed, why we'll be re-looking at that in the coming year and re-tendering that. We've certainly been encouraging uh, Scottish individuals and organisations to get involved with that because those costs are, are not lost on us. But there's something around the availability of both skill sets and, and the time, actually, when the intervention comes up that's there. Michael, I, I don't know if you have anything else to, to, to add to that. Um, do you want to add anything else to that first, and then we'll touch on the, the example that Mr Gibson mm -hmm. gives us? I think mm -hmm. the important thing to say in that regard is that we, we did conduct an open selection yeah. process, um, and um, we um, assessed those that came forward. Um, there are very particular skill sets that are needed for people um, who are able to go into failing organisations, um, stabilise them, um, start to develop the necessary improvement plans. And it's important that we have those skills available to us so that we can act um, effectively and quickly when we need to. Um, and indeed, so that those uh, individuals are able to keep the duration of any intervention as short as it possibly can, thereby uh, hopefully minimising... I'm sorry, are costs um, a factor cost. in these selection processes? Are costs a factor? So yes. Get, yeah. Yes. So you would think, well, we might bring this guy in for down south, but he might 
cost twenty thousand more or whatever that would be. A, that would be a mitigating factor against. Uh, absolutely, we would take that. We would take that into account mm. when we're looking at who we appoint to okay. what. Um, both availability and 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 price is a factor yeah. uh, yes. uh, in those considerations. Um, perhaps. Uh, 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 Mm -hmm. George is, is fine with this. I'll pick up on your second point yes, about the um, the two point six uh, million. Well, in the first the first point you made was around um, 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 where where there's a, a, a dispute about us uh, intervening in that that yeah. particular uh, association that you're referring to. Uh, there was indeed um, we have an appeal process. Um, that organisation um, made an appeal. Uh, and the appeal is heard by um, two of our board members and an independent um, uh, panellist. Uh, and that appeal was heard just before Christmas. Um, and the appeal panel upheld um, the, the decision to intervene. So there is that route um, of appeal uh, that organisations um, can take. And in that instance, that organisation did um, take up that option of the appeal. Um, the, the, the scale of the financial um, cost, um, I think what, it, what it's probably important to say in, in, in that regard, um, firstly, um, we need to be careful about what we say in terms of what's commercially sensitive information, uh, particularly around ongoing um, discussions between an organisation and its lenders. Um, and, and as George has said, it is the case that we're um, a, a, a landlord is faced with um, such a level of, of, of weakness uh, in its governance, failures in, in, in uh, how it's being run, that there can be costs on the back of an intervention. Um, we're, we're very open that that is a, a, a reality there. Um, our assessment, however, is that any potential costs to that particular RSL's borrowing is likely to be considerably short um, of that figure that's been quoted. Okay, well, I'm, th I'm sure it'll be a relief to the tenants, otherwise we'll be paying an average of £3,250 each over uh, 10 years. Mr. No, oh, so I apologise. Yeah, no, sorry, it's okay. It was just, just to say, I mean, one of the things that the, the, the forum has said is that, um, that uh, SHR needs to be certain that no other viable alternatives to statutory action are available. It was just to see what you, you do to ensure that. And they've suggested that where the immediate viability of an association is not in question, they create some kind of breathing space or cooling off period, which would allow measured decisions to be made. I think I'd say two things to that. As, as Michael's described, um, we already do that. That's not public, though. Right. And it's that it's that fine line, isn't it, between what we say? Because actually, no organisation, and in some cases, organisations, as Michael described, who have come to us and said, "You know what? We've got an issue," can help, and those discussions take place. I don't think any organisation wants us at that point, uh, over sometimes periods of long months, when those discussions are taking place, to be washing their dirty linen in public, as you say, and saying organisation A, B, or C has an issue, and, and we're working on it with them. Um, so we already do that and work with organisations and there, there's much work that goes on behind the scenes that, that isn't necessarily seen because of that. It's just fixed and sorted and it's done. And so um, the, the process that Michael described of this early work takes periods of, of, of months. It's not a few weeks. Um, if we took, we would certainly take examples where we signal very clearly and if we take the case that, that, that um, the forum has raised um, concerns about, um, it, it, I am assured, and my board was assured, that that organisation was under no illusion that they had a period of time to work with us and try and fix this, or we may need to step in. Again, that took, that discussion took place over a period of months. We didn't just announce to them on a Friday that we're intervening on a Monday. So the first thing is that that's there. The second thing to say is because we recognise the sensitivities of these things, um, there, there in fact was a, was a proposal made through the uh, framework review and I've forgotten who made it, actually. Michael might, might pick it up, because I forget. But actually saying, you know, to be more transparent, could you apply a, 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 you know, an, an intervention notice? You know, and say, here's an intervention notice, and if you don't sort this in a month or a week, or whatever, whatever, um, you'll do that. And indeed, the board had a discussion um, just last week about whether that's something that we could consider and whether we could do. But of course, it's back to that sensitivity issue. 
because because lots of organisations have sometimes minor issues that they're talking to us about, do we want to post a notice that, that, that we're talking to them? So we're having a debate around whether there is something we could do there that enhances that transparency, because we're all for transparency, um, or indeed, you know, or how would we avoid any unintended consequences of that, if, if that makes sense? Mm. Michael, would you add yeah, anything no, else? No, I think, I think we'll move on now. We have got uh, a lot of questions Thanks. still to be asked. Okay. We've got a very busy agenda uh, ahead of us this morning, so I'd ask that if the answers could be kept a bit shorter, that would be really, really helpful. Alec and then Annabel want to come in on points of reason. If, if, if there's a, a shortage in terms of Scotland, in terms of these statutory managers with the expertise to bring in, are you going to take some action to try and address that, um, to try and... and skills up, training, whatever, to be able to, to have that flexibility and more people available in Scotland. And is there a flexibility there? Because it just seems it's not flexible in terms of, you know, the, the, what they seem to be saying here is that if there was the opportunity, if you identify there are issues, they then have the opportunity to go and bring expertise in themselves, then that, that does not lead to what they describe as the crippling costs as a result of your statutory inter intervention. I'll leave that. Yeah, um, I'm happy to pick up. In terms of the... We're a regulator. Um, we um, absolutely will look to rerun the open selection process and uh, it may very well be that, that that enables us to have more Scottish-based um, statutory managers available to us uh, and that would be no bad thing. Um, I, I, I would question whether it's our role to, you know, create the marketplace for that and 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 but what we will certainly do is ensure that we run an open um, selection process uh, uh, we'll, we'll uh, make that uh, as widely known uh, as we possibly can um, so that we get as as many people coming forward to 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 be considered for that selection as 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 as, as, as possible um, I think uh, in terms of your 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 your, your second point um, uh, there our, our normal way of working um, is, as you've described it, um, that's what happens just now. Um, we are engaging directly with a number of, of um, RSLs um, where they are cooperating with us. They are bringing in um, additional cooperatives onto their board or they are bringing in additional management capacity um, to help them uh, make the necessary improvements and therefore avoiding the need for us to have to use our statutory intervention powers. That's our normal way of working. Uh, and, and in fact, we do that in more organisations than we use our statutory intervention powers in. Okay. Thank you. Annabelle, and then if you want, you want to answer questions after that. Okay, uh, thank you, Computer, and good morning, gentlemen. Um, just picking up uh, on that point there, I mean, what then, in, in Briefly, it is the key are the key components of the skill set um, that we're talking about for these statutory managers? In a couple of sentences, what are the what is the skill set required? Some of the key things are being able to um, come in very quickly into an organisation, understand uh, what the challenges and, and difficulties are, and and do what is needed to stabilise the situation. Um, and that involves um, uh, looking at the, the situation with staff, with the governing body, and critically also with the organisation's lenders. Um, okay, so, so uh, therefore, going back one step, what kind of, um, when you would, would consider a, a, an applicant for their suitability for that role, what kind of um, qualifications or experience would you be looking for to show that they could then perform that role? I think, I think um, you use the term experience, and I think that's absolutely critical. But what kind of experience? We're looking for experience of having turned around failing organisations. Um, that's that's a, a very important one. And I think it's, it's, it's probably worthwhile saying that um, uh, these are organisations where we're having to intervene. These are organisations with um, significant and deep-rooted problems. Um, and uh, it's not... It would be it would be wrong of us to consider this as a kind of development opportunity for somebody who's not got the necessary skills and experience already there. I think that would not be us um, 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 doing what we need to do to fully protect the interests of tenants in those organisations. So we're looking for people with the right skills and critically the experience of having um, worked in those similar types of situations before 
And that gives us the confidence that they're going to be able to go into that organisation and quickly start doing what needs to be done. OK. Well, I mean, it's quite, it's quite broad brush, and I really struggle to understand, therefore, why in Scotland, with all the various uh, skilled people we have who have dealt with you know, umpteen different kinds of organisations, scenarios, uh, in terms of the experience they've gathered, I find it very, very difficult to understand that there wouldn't be anybody suitable in Scotland. But if I could just ask on that point, if, if perhaps you could write to the committee setting forth exactly what it is when you make your open tender, what, what it is that you are specifying. And in the regard to the open tender, very briefly, uh, convener, um, you say that the Chief Exec said a moment ago that you were looking to run the to, to rerun the open selection tender process. What, what do you mean by that? Are you setting forth a, a new tender? So when is that to happen? The, uh, over the course of this coming year. OK, and for how long will that, the result of that be in place? Um, at the moment, I think the, uh, the current one has run for three years. Um, so and I think that's to... what we'd look to do again. Well, I, I, would, I would have thought, given the committee's comments, that you would, find it, you would find it quite important, therefore, to do what you could to ensure that there is a, awareness raised in Absolutely. Scotland that uh, you know, people in Scotland can apply. Um, because I think you've, you've felt the, the slight um, frustration on the part of members of the committee that an awful lot of public money is being spent. Perhaps it could be viewed unnecessarily when there is very good homegrown talent in place that with a bit of um, you know, a focused attention you could probably find uh, and therefore they would do a great job. Could I perhaps turn to Please. my next question? I'm getting a look from the convener. Um, OK, um, so on a different subject, um, obviously... Um, one of the requirements in your annual report is to uh, to discuss the performance of landlords uh, as against the Scottish uh, Social Charter uh, standards and outcomes. And I just wonder if you could uh, tell the committee how landlords have performed uh, as against that uh, charter over the last uh, year. Uh, I can. I'm happy to, to pick that up. And on page, you, you may or may not have to have right in front of you, I don't know the, the annual report. On page five of the annual report, there's a summary. Uh, it, it, we can easily send it to you if you'd like. That talks about the 90% satisfaction levels that, that I touched on, Ms Ewing. And it talks about there are 16 charter outcomes in the Scottish Housing Charter. Um, of those, um, in the past year, 11 have improved. Um, and the others, the remaining five, have remained stable. None have gone backward. So that would point to um, pretty solid performance. And I think I'm right in saying, albeit I, I've only been chair for 18 months, that, that over the past five years and the, pa the five years' worth of data um, that we have um, published, we have seen improving trends in terms of compliance against a, uh, a good number of the standards. But as it stands, um, 11 improved and 5 were stable of the 16. Well, thank you for that. And obviously, it's, it's heartening to see that progress is indeed being made. Um, but if we take, for example, the, the level of satisfaction generally that you cited, which is yes. high at 90%, at I think you said. Yes. Um, but if we look then at, for example, factoring services, although that has, it's, it has to be properly mentioned, uh, increased over the last year, nonetheless, it sits a bit lower than that high level of, of satisfaction overall, so it sits at 67.4%. What, what do you think is, is going on there? and What do you think needs to happen to see that uh, increase further? Because obviously, you know, factoring services are a very important part of a tenant's experience. Yes. I'll maybe get Michael to comment on that and just say that the, the data I was using there at the 90% it, it is about tenants uh, only, just because I wouldn't want to mislead the committee that that's a global number covering everything. But Michael, would you like to comment on factoring? Yeah, and you're absolutely right. There is a there is a um, a difference in the the satisfaction level between tenants and between those uh, owners who receive factoring services from um, social landlords, uh, and that's why we um, carried out a, a, a thematic uh, inquiry into factoring to help us understand uh, uh, you know what the kind of key issues may be for um, factor donors. And interestingly, the key issues in many regards for factor donors are more simple and straightforward than they are for tenants and it's it's largely about the responsiveness of the landlord and then the management fee level um, and we've seen a, a modest increase in the the satisfaction level at the same time as we've seen a, a modest 
decrease in the average uh, management fee. Now, uh, whether those th uh, two things are a, a direct causal link or not, it, it, it would probably require a bit more investigation. But um, it, we will we will continue to keep a focus on factoring um, services, given this disparity between um, the uh, the satisfaction levels of factored owners and tenants. And the same can be said, I, I have to say, also for the satisfaction level amongst gypsy travellers who um, um, uh, use, use the services provided by social landlords through um, gypsy traveller sites. They have a lower satisfaction level than tenants too, and that's a, another reason why we have a, a strong focus on what's happening uh, uh, on those gypsy traveller sites. OK, well, that's, that's good to, to hear. And obviously, uh, as regards to the figures, uh, whilst for RSLs the, uh, the, the satisfaction rate has increased, uh, uh, in terms of factoring services, uh, the f position with regard to local authority factoring services appears to have been in decline over the last few years. I wonder if you've got any specific uh, comment about that. Nothing specific around um, why that is. We, we, we understand that position. Uh, and when we're engaging with individual landlords, uh, we're looking at why those kind of um, situations might arise. I mean, obviously, within... Uh, those are averages, so within some local authorities the position has indeed improved, uh, in others it's not. And we engage with uh, individual landlords uh, uh, around those factors when they come through uh, in our annual risk assessment uh, as critical. Um, so uh, beyond that, uh, I have nothing to say. Okay, but that. perhaps then it would, it would merit further engagement of a more detailed sort, and perhaps also it would be appropriate to, if, you, if indeed some local authorities are being tarred unfairly with this kind of gloomy um, uh, uh, conclusion of the position over the last years, it might be helpful to have the table of the 32 local authorities and say who's making progress and, and who needs a bit more uh, attention, which ones need a bit more attention, because that would be useful yeah. information. Yeah. Uh, and we'd improve transparency, I would have thought. And there's, there's a couple of things around that. Our um, engagement plans um, will set out um, whether we're engaging with a, 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 a local authority around factoring services, so there will be that transparency there. And the data uh, is all in the public domain. Uh, we put that out in an open data um, format, uh, but we will be looking uh, again at how we present all that information, partly through the, the, the work we're doing around our website, but also in, in um, some other work we're doing about how we can get the, the best information to people in the best way so that they can find it most usable. Um, uh, and that, that offers opportunities for an even greater level of transparency around some of this information. OK, we'll watch that space. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much, Alec. Uh, can I just quickly ask a, a question around, around rents and affordability? Can, can you say what's been happening this year in terms of rents? Um, any predictions that you have in terms of where rents are, are going? Do you think that it is still affordable? Uh, albeit that it's quite a relative question, but are we providing good value for money? And are you satisfied with the levels of engagement with tenants in terms of setting rents? I think it's, uh, it's worth starting that off by saying that, uh, in our view, generally, um, we believe that, that current rent for most tenants um, in most homes is affordable. Um, but we do know from our work with um, the National Panel of Tenants and Service Users um, that future affordability is a major concern. Um, over two-thirds um, of the panel members um, uh, identified to us that this was an issue that concerned them. Um, principally, I think, around uh, worries about uh, the, the changes in the benefit system and how that would impact on their ability to pay rent. But it is a, a, an issue of significant concern um, for tenants. Um, can say that, that over the, uh, the period uh, covered by our annual report, um, we know that um, rent increased on average uh, by 2.4%, um, up to an average figure of £76 per week. Um, differences between uh, RSLs and local authorities are roughly about £11 a week um, uh, in that rent. Um, uh, what, what, what is quite interesting is that um, uh, back in when we started measuring uh, this back in 2013-14, um, the planned rent increases by um, um, landlords was at 3.6%. Um, 
we then started to engage with landlords around that and to, to put messages out about a concern around continuing affordability in a situation where planned rent increases were above inflation and uh, certainly well above uh, planned increases in um, uh, the, 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 the income of tenants that we were seeing at that point, whether that was from uh, earnings or from, from benefits. Um, the planned increases over that period then fell um, to a, a low point of 1.9% in 2016. Last year, we did notice that it started to go up again. Uh, it's last year, the planned increase in rents uh, at an average level uh, was 3.2%. Uh, so that's a, a, an issue that we are again focusing on in terms of um, uh, continued ability of tenants to pay. It is worth saying, obviously, that landlords all start at different positions on rent levels, and some may very well have uh, a bit of room where they could look to increase their rents while keeping them affordable. But it absolutely is something that, w that, that, that we will be um, keeping a very close eye on in terms of uh, rent increases, uh, affordability to tenants. Great, okay. thank you. Thanks very much, Howard. Uh, okay, I want to ask a couple of questions around your report into homelessness in Glasgow. Can you give us the key findings and tell us what progress the council is making in improving the homelessness service? It would be fair to say that this is a significant piece of work, uh, Mr Dornan, um, done over the course of last year that the council got engaged with, um, very engaged. And indeed, what was interesting when we, we had shared the report that was finally published that, that you're referring to with them, and what was very valuable in that engagement, because we talked about people working with us, was that they accepted what we were saying in that report that was helpful. Um, there's been subsequent um, engagement with them now, um, and we are now at the point where um, in the last quarter of last year, there was some evidence of some modest improvements, but it was modest. There was an improvement. There was a plan agreed with that. And I'll let Michael maybe come on to talking about the next steps, because there'll be a next leg to this, which will start quite soon. Yeah, I, and I, I think it's worth um, just restating what we did find in that um, report um, in March last year. And that was that um, um, people who are homeless in Glasgow are waiting too long to get a house um, and that they're spending too much time in temporary accommodation. Um, the council was not housing uh, people quickly enough um, and it wasn't referring enough people to RSLs um, to enable it to discharge its statutory duty quickly enough to everyone. Uh, RSLs, uh, some RSLs were making a good contribution to um, helping the council uh, meet its duties, uh, but some could do more uh, in that regard. So uh, we made a, a series of recommendations um, to the council uh, and to RSLs, and we have been monitoring um, the implementation uh, of, of the, the, the council's and RSLs' response uh, to those recommendations. We will now go back into the council um, over the coming uh, months um, to examine exactly what outcomes are being achieved and delivered. Uh, and that will then determine uh, what our next steps as a regulator are uh, and how we uh, engage with the council thereafter. So can I, I just clarify then that the council took on all your suggestions and now you're going back and see what the practical outcome of the, 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 the council has. agreed um, with all of the recommendations. Um, our, I guess our, our principal concern is around the pace of change um, and whether um, w w the changes that are happening in the Council are happening quickly enough to uh, be able to demonstrate um, those genuine and significant and sustained ch uh, changes in the outcomes for homeless people. And that's what we want to go in and test. OK, thank you. Uh, I notice you're now engaging with 19 local authorities and homelessness services. Uh, are the common themes that need to be addressed to improve these services? We, we uh, have indeed engaged with 19 councils um, over the, the, the last year uh, around homelessness. And there, there have been some um, quite um, consistent themes um, for, for that engagement. Um, and they tend to, to be around, uh, firstly, the access to the service itself. Um, then around how quickly people are being moved through into permanent accommodation. Um, the the um, 
availability and, and quality um, of temporary accommodation uh, is another significant issue. Um, and also the kind of advice and support that, that, that people are provided with as they're going through um, uh, that, that journey um, around homelessness. Um, so those, those are um, the kind of main things that, 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 that have um, led us to engage with, with, with 19 local authorities. Probably worth saying that on the back of the work we did with Glasgow, um, that's given us a, a, a much clearer understanding of where some of the, uh, the challenges rest uh, in delivering effective um, homelessness services. And we are using that to um, help us direct where we need to uh, uh, have a higher level of scrutiny uh, around homelessness. Um, and I think in particular that will be very much that focus on the individual's journey through the statutory homelessness process. Okay, thank you very much. The, the, just on uh, the work you'll be doing in homelessness in the future, is there anything outside of what you've, you've mentioned there that you intend to do in, in the future? I think it's very much about um, us uh, picking up on some of the agendas that are coming out from um, the Scottish Government uh, in response to um, uh, the recommendations from the HARSAG. Um, and that, that, I think in particular, uh, will um, result in a, a clearer position around the expected standards on temporary accommodation. And we will look to pick up a monitoring role um, around that. Now that that's in development at the moment, so that's one that we will we will run alongside to ensure that what we put in place uh, enables us to report back effectively on whether those standards are being achieved. Okay, thank you, uh, Graham. You want to come in very briefly? Yes, yeah, a very quick follow-up to the convener's line of questioning. Um, as you'll know, we've we, this committee has done a, a major piece of work on homelessness. Um, now I read with in interest your report on Glasgow. Uh, that was easy to find. Um, now, you've said you're going back to, to Glasgow, you'll be working with them. Um, is it, will there be a follow-up report? I mean, can we monitor yes. easily how improve, whether improvements have been made? Uh, when will that be published? We, we will publish that, uh, uh, that report. Um, and uh, the timescales haven't been fully finalised yet, but I would expect that to be um, relatively early in the new financial year. That's good. Right, thank you. Could, could I go back to, you mentioned earlier when we talked about rents, benefits. Um, I saw a report recently where, I think it was five councils said they had over a million pound of housing debt that was directly as a result of universal credit. Have you looked at what the impact to universal credit is on our RSLs? Sorry. I'll maybe pick that up at, at the kind of gross level. Um, if you look at last year's, bearing in mind our financials and where we are reporting in the financials of RSLs and uh, arrears, etc., is always a bit behind, given the financial reporting, just so you know. Um, there is no evidence yet, based on our last couple of years' annual report, that there's any significant, at that point, significant increase in arrears taking place. There's certainly anecdotal evidence around different organisations, you, you, you name one, Mr Rowley, um, that, that they're seeing a different pattern. Um, certainly, some would say there's patterns where the various test and pilot programmes around universal credit have been in place. But at a totality level, there is not yet any evidence of massively increased uh, or significantly, sorry, uh, let me change that word, uh, significantly increased rent arrears taking place, which would be one of the signals of that, albeit there would be pockets of within the RSL and local authority community that are flagging this as an emerging issue. But of course, in Scotland, there were a mod there are a modest number of pilots taking place. So I think some would say the real impact hasn't hit yet of that, but it's something we're certainly paying attention to. Michael, in terms of more up to date and what, what the team is seeing day to day and hearing something beyond the published evidence, Mr Rowley, is there stuff you'd add to that? Obviously, we'll, we'll be getting um, the new set of figures um, fairly early in the, the new financial yeah. year. Um, and that is one that we will be paying close attention to, to see whether there is any evidence of that starting to come through in the reported level of rent arrears. Um, I mean, I think, I think uh, 
partly the, the, the mitigating actions that have been taken by the Scottish Government uh, have, have um, addressed some of the potential impacts that there could have been up until now. But I think we are expecting to see an impact. Um, exactly when that starts to come through, um, uh, we'll see in the figures. Um, but we are absolutely getting the kind of anecdotal information that, 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 that you touched on from individual landlords, that this is starting to have an impact, particularly those um, in, in the vanguard of the, the rollout of universal credit and the associated sanctions. Um, and, and I touched earlier that, that um, through our work with the National Panel of Tenants and Service Users, we were getting a strong sense back from them that this is an issue that they are particularly concerned about around future affordability of rent. Okay. And is there any other sort of major challenges facing uh, social landlords? Risks, uncertainties? Yes, and uh, we publish um, every November uh, 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 a statement of the key risks that we will focus on. Uh, we've touched on a number of them already today. I think some of the, um, uh, you know, it's, it's possibly unfortunate that we haven't got through this whole um, discussion um, without mentioning the word Brexit, uh, but I'm going to do so now. Um, I think we're, we're very aware of some of the potential risks that there can be for um, social landlords around some of the consequences um, of, of Brexit, in particular uh, uh, around um, supply chain um, disruption, uh, the potential increase in cost um, that might come from that, um, labour um, supplies, particularly in construction uh, and maintenance, uh, is an issue. And we're also aware that there are a significant number of EU nationals who live in, in homes provided by social landlords, and there are, there are uncertainties around um, what, what, what their position might be and, and, and what impact that may have on um, a landlord's um, um, level of, of lets and, and, and income stream. So there's, there's, there's absolutely um, issues there that we, uh, we're looking at. Um, the, uh, the lending market uh, is unquestionably becoming more competitive um, and that presents challenges for, uh, for landlords and there is the potential for some increasing cost to landlords um, as a result of that. Uh, and we're also seeing more landlords um, venturing into the capital markets rather than using traditional lending. Uh, and that, that can bring um, challenges, opportunities as well, but challenges and, and some risks. So we'll be, we'll be um, making sure that we are monitoring the, the impacts of those kind of developments in the sector. Okay. Thank you very much, Alec. Uh, Alexander. Mr Walker, you talked about earlier about managing the risks and managing the costs. Uh, and we talked about you know, your budget initially and in the report you, you highlight some of that and the demands you have and the capacity that you're trying to, to deal with. Uh, in the report you talk about 80% of the costs are related to staff. Yeah. Uh, and the staffing complement has reduced uh, from 80 to 50. Uh, so can I maybe ask if you can give us some update and some comments on the budget? And if yes. you maybe can expand uh, on the concerns you have about staff vacancies going forward. Yep, I, I certainly can. Um, to give some sense of, of where SHR has been and, and is now, uh, our budget at its maximum, a lot like all of the Scottish public sector, we're all having to tighten belts, and that's appropriate, of course, in, the, in this environment. Um, the budget was 4.7 million. It got to a low of 3.7 million, and the staff complement fell as a result of that. We got a modest increase uh, in the past, uh, this current year, and, and for the and for the upcoming year, which we're we're very uh, grateful to receive. Um, because 80% of our costs are staff costs, as you've picked up, that means that the ability to trim fat is, is much more limited. So we've moved, uh, we've moved location, we've moved our office and saved, I think, about a th was that a third, uh, more of our costs in doing that. We've gone through, we're in the process of, of realigning ourselves and organising ourselves internally differently to align with the new framework to do that. Um, the slight... D the discussion the board had just last week, actually, and the concern around around recruitment has been um, twofold. One, um, there was a recent pause in recruitment at Scottish Government. Obviously, our recruitment goes through that source, albeit we're a, an independent regulator. There was a recent pause. Understandably, we knew that because of Brexit, and that put us on hold. Um, the process for us feels a bit 
challenging at times. We had one post that we were recruiting to, it took us 11 months of going through it, because as a regulator, as you might guess, um, we have to go through an internal recruitment process first, we can then go externally, and the reality is for us, sometimes some of the skill sets that the regulators are looking for are, um, in, uh, are more rare, uh, and therefore we're going to struggle to find them within the, the civil service, and we have to go externally, and so for us, that process is very elongated. And, and causes us pause. Um, because of that, the board sat down just recently, as recently as last week and actually looked at that and started to assess getting ourselves ready for the new framework, a reorganisation internally, um, where we not to be able to recruit to those posts, um, how we would handle that and what we would hold back on doing. So I suppose the message I'm trying to give you is that, you know, resources have gone down, that's fine, we've managed that. Mm -hmm. um, we, as well as resources going down, we've absorbed an increase of, I think at last count, about half a million pounds of unfunded costs. And we've coped with that, I, I'd like to think, fairly admirably and done it. What we're signalling now is that having gotten some enhanced resources, for which we're very grateful, we've got to pick up the pace of recruitment, and that is proving challenging. And of course, some of that is because there's a lot going on in Scottish government. There's Brexit, there's Brexit preparation, and we, we'd all get that. But of course, we've had um, a lot of focus on recruitment for the new tax authority, the Social Security Authority, and so on. And so it's been slim pickings, if I can put it that way, to attract candidates within internally, and hence going externally matters. So we're just signalling that that's a worry for us. Um, it will manage that worry, because the board is on it, and we'll look at what contingency plans that we would put in place should that challenge get greater. And Does that help? Yep, and you've, you've identified that you've had this programme of efficiency savings and, and, and that, yes. that, has, that has assisted and helped you uh, to, to deal with some of the challenges and some of the demands that you have. Yes. But, but are you getting to the stage that you think that there's a risk that you're not able to provide and you're not going to be in the same capacity uh, across that organisation to ensure that you can uh, tackle all the demands that you're now challenging? Mm. I, I, I think I'd say... I may pass to Michael in the detail, but actually I think I'd say at a high level, two things. Um, one, I feel our resources are at the stage where the, the extra resources have been given are really helpful. Mm -hmm. I think without that, it would have been a challenge, but I have to recognise that the Scottish Government ha has given us those extra resources. We made the case, and that's been very, very valuable um, to us. Um, what would prove a challenge would be two things. One, if we, if we, this pace of recruitment continued yeah. to be there and was slow, and two, if we, ca if we were to see the number of interventions go up. Interventions take a lot of resource. It's a big sucking of resource into those. And so that's why the whole approach to the new framework, uh, Mr Stewart, has been around this self-assurance, getting getting organisations to, to self-identify. Now look, we're not aft. We know that won't change overnight. And that's why we're working with, with landlords on the toolkit that we talked about and so on, because we would like to see that come down. So by effectively managing those two the things, our, our resources and our ability to recruit, the challenge I've identified, and, and trying to manage down the levels of intervention, we would hope we would be in a good place. What we would worry about uh, at this point in time would be the perfect storm would be if we can't recruit, we can't fill those vacancies we've got and we get hit with you know, a significant number of more complex interventions, that would be the perfect negative storm for us, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But although we're flagging concerns, I'd also want to assure the committee, um, this is something the board is very cited on. Uh, and indeed, we are planning for. Okay. okay. Thank so, you very much. So you'll, you'll, you'll manage to cope with any difficulties that you may see. You think that that, because, you know, let's say you've made efficiency already, uh, and are you able to make any further efficiencies going forward? Do you see any scope for that, or not at all? Do you want to add to that, Michael? Yeah, I, I, I think um, we, we've, we've taken out somewhere between about 30 to 40 percent of the cost from our organisation over that period of change that we've gone through. Um, our staff account for about 80% of our uh, our budget. Um, we currently, um, as at today, have a 15% vacancy rate, um, largely as a consequence of the challenges around recruitment that, that George has touched on. I, I think that makes it challenging for us to keep delivering at the level we are delivering. We have extraordinarily committed and professional mm -hmm. people working in our organisation, uh, and they do what's needed to be done. But I obviously have a duty of care uh, to them in terms of their, their well-being. Um, and I think if we, if we can get to the, 
um, the place where we um, don't have the vacancy rate that we currently have, and there's not any significant change in the demand levels on us, then I'm confident that we'll be able to deliver um, what we are we are asked to deliver. Um, but it's those two sides to the coin that are, are challenging. And I recognise that that's not necessarily different to a whole range of other public bodies uh, at the moment, given some of the challenges that there are uh, in that field. Thank, thank you. Very thank you very much. Uh, Annabel, last question. Uh, yes, thank you, Commissioner. Um, looking to the, uh, the slight changes to your powers further to the... ONS's reclassification of RSLs as private, um, private sector bodies. Uh, do you feel that you're you're absolutely in top tip top shape to to deal with these slight changes to your powers? I think we feel we're ready to handle it. I'll maybe get Michael to comment though. Yes. Uh, and um, th this is the, the the main change that has a, a, a most immediate impact is the change around our consent powers. Um, and those consent powers will um, end on the 8th of March. Um, and just a couple of weeks ago, we wrote to all uh, registered social landlords to um, identify, flag to them that this change is coming, to set out what they would need to do, uh, both in advance of that day and then after that. Uh, and we're also um, currently producing guidance for landlords that will be available to them um, at the end of February um, that, that relates to the situation that will then be in place after that critical date. And we'll use every opportunity we can to keep flagging um, those changes um, to landlords so that both we and indeed the sector are ready for those changes when they come in. We've also done uh, a significant amount of work to our IT systems to ensure that they're ready for that switch over from consents to notifications. OK, okay. thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, with that positive note, we will. Uh, I'll thank George and Michael for attending today's suggestions. Thank you. Thank you. I suspend briefly to allow the witnesses to leave the table. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item three is consideration of two statutory instruments which seek to modify the Housing Scotland Act 2006, and I refer members to paper number three. I wish to welcome Kevin Stewart, Minister for Local Government, Housing and Planning, Simon Roberts, Policy Manager, Housing Standard and Quality, and Kirsten Simone Lefebvre, Solicitor, Scottish Government. The, these instruments are laid under affirmative procedure, which means that the Parliament must approve them before the provisions can come into force. 
Following this evidence session, the committee will be invited at the next agenda items to consider motions to approve each instrument. I now invite the Minister to make a short opening statement. Uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning to the committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear today uh, to speak to the motion to approve the Housing Scotland Act 2006 modification of the Repairing Standard Regulations 2019 and the Housing Scotland Act 2006 Supplemental Provision Order 2019. Um, for technical reasons, convener, the amendments to the repairing standard are split into two separate instruments because powers to make orders and regulations cannot be combined. Uh, these instruments taken together uh, will improve the repairing standard, uh, the standard required of homes provided by landlords in the private rented sector. Uh, this meets a commitment uh, in the programme for government to introduce changes to improve the condition of properties in the private rented sector and follows our public consultation in 2017 on these changes. Um, there are several specific provisions uh, in these instruments. Firstly, um, there are measures that come into force from 1st of March 2019, which are intended to clarify existing duties under the standard, uh, to provide that a house must meet the statutory tolerable standard, to make it clear that the repairing standard does not apply to short-term holiday lets, uh, and to recognise that landlords are not at fault if other owners refuse consent to carry out common works. Secondly, um, from the 1st of April 2021, the duty uh, to provide fire and smoke alarms uh, will be removed from the repairing standard. Uh, this is because we are extending uh, the standard currently required in the private rented sector to all tenures. Uh, from that date, the duty will be part of the tolerable standard applying to all houses, so this change uh, will not affect what is required of private landlords. Thirdly, um, there are some substantive changes which will raise and improve the repairing standard and which will come into force from 1st of March 2024, so that landlords have five years to bring houses up to standard. Uh, these changes will require private rented housing to have safely accessible food storage and food preparation space, safe access and use of any common parts in a tenement, secure common doors with satisfactory locks, devices to reduce the risk of ele electric electrocution and electrical fires, uh, a fixed heating system so that there will have to be a system or installation in houses for heating space and water, uh, and we're adding other fuels to the existing duty uh, requiring gas and electrical installations to be safe. Uh, we will work with uh, stakeholders to develop guidance to support landlords in these changes and the regulations specify matters uh, that guidance may cover uh, and this will also include uh, the condition of pipes supplying water for human consumption. Uh, finally, um, from March 2027, the existing exclusion for various types of housing under agricultural tenancies will be removed um, from the repairing standard. Uh, this realises the commitment that I made together with the Cabinet Secretary uh, for the Rural Economy at the Agricultural Housing Summit in Perth on the 1st of October last year that housing in this sector should meet the repairing standard uh, within eight years. It is unacceptable for tenants and families living in housing under agricultural tenancies in Scotland in 2018 to be living in substandard homes, which we would not accept if provided by a private landlord in our urban areas. Uh, convener, these instruments are an important contribution uh, to improving the quality of our private rented housing. However, I recognise uh, that more needs to be done. And that is why, for example, uh, I will give serious consideration uh, to the final recommendations of the cross-party working group on tenement maintenance uh, to drive a culture of change to encourage proactive maintenance in tenements. And of course, uh, we have separate work going on uh, to deal with holiday and short-term lets. Uh, 
Uh, to conclude, these instruments bring forward a range of measures uh, which are supported by stakeholders to meet our commitment to raise standards in the private rented sector, helping to ensure uh, that private tenants are able to live in homes that meet uh, a standard that they are entitled to expect. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, I invite questions from members. Alec Bowley, then, Andrew. I, I would agree with the, the Minister in terms of the improvements that are being made, but the timescales seem a bit long, five years and then for agriculture, eight years. I mean, what's your thoughts on that? Um, convener, uh, we need to uh, give a reasonable amount of time to carry out the work um, and to spread the cost, uh, particularly where planned works will be needed uh, across uh, a number of properties. Uh, and we sought views on implementation in our consultation. Um, and there was overall support for the implementation period um, that we have put in place. However, convener, um, I would encourage um, landlords, uh, private landlords, to begin this work now if they are not already up to these standards um, that we are <coughs> setting. Um, it's always a fine balance. Um, I agree with Mr Rowley, um, but I think that we have got that balance right, giving folk the opportunity uh, to get that work done over a period. But I would get, encourage all to move further and faster if they can. Yeah, because I just think there's a danger that people will wait till, till and say, I've got five years to do that. Can I also ask an, a different question? In terms of energy efficiency standards within the private rented sector, where are you at with that? Um, in terms of energy efficiency, the Energy Efficient Scotland route map uh, convener, which was launched in May of last year, uh, confirmed that we would bring forward regulations uh, that would require private rented sector properties to be at EPC Band E, uh, a change in tenancy from the 1st of April 2020, and in all properties uh, by 31st of March 2022. Um, uh, and EPC Band D uh, change of tenancy from the 1st of April 2022 uh, and in all properties by 31st of March uh, 2022. The consultation accompanying the route map also proposed that all PRS properties be required to meet EPC Band C by 2030 uh, where technically feasible and cost effective. Um, we will publish uh, draft regulations for consultation in the first half of this year um, for minimum energy efficiency standards, Convener. Okay, thank you very much. And, convener, <clears throat> a couple of questions, uh, Minister. The, um, the changes you're proposing to make, safe kitchens and uh, fuels and, and doors, etc., <clears throat> excuse me, um, are being introduced as a modification of section 13, 4A, 5 and 6 of the Housing Scotland Act. Um, section 13, 1 of that says that a house meets the repairing standard if, and then it talks about wind and water tight, structure and exterior of the house, supply of water, gas and electricity. So I'm just wondering what considerations are in your mind when you choose to um, put new criteria for meeting the repairing standard uh, in section 13A, which is an absolute, you must do this, um, or the 4A, 5 and 6, which is to meet it, you must have regard to these things. Having regard to things is obviously a fine judgment, but I mean, there's a Convener, we've had uh, discussions previously at this committee around about the use of terminology, um, including have a regard to. Um, I will uh, pass to um, uh, Ms. Seminet Lefebvre to uh, give the, uh, the legalese in terms of uh, re in regard to, and then I'll come back to uh, Mr. Whiteman's point in general. Yes, we're adding certain criteria to the repairing standard that a house must meet in order to to meet that standard. The conditions in sections 4, A, 5 and 6 is the guidance of how to determine whether a house has met that. And that guidance has been replaced also by Regulation 3.3, which explains how you decide if they've met the standard. OK, I'm with you. Okay. Thank you for that explanation. Yes, that makes sense. Right. Um, that's useful. Um, second question, um, on the holiday lets, um, the, the, the policy note says that this is um, 
already covered by existing legislation, but it but it clarifies legislation that's to come into force from the 1st of March 2019. First of all, <coughs> what is that legislation from the 1st of March 9, 2019? Um, is that First of all, uh, just to clarify, the Housing Acts of 84, 88, 2016 um, do not include um, holiday lets. Under the current rules, uh, a holiday let is most likely to be regarded as an occupancy agreement uh, rather than a tenancy and is therefore not subject uh, to the repairing standard. Um, this is not changing. Okay. Um, but because the question of whether um, a particular let is a, an occupancy agreement or a tenancy, which is a question of fact, it's not always clear for the owner whether or not the standard applies. So we are clarifying uh, this uh, in these regulations. Beyond that, as I said um, in my opening remarks, convener, and Mr Whiteman is, is very well aware, um, we're looking... Um, uh, through a working group at short-term lets as a whole. Um, they are gov governed uh, by other regimes, um, but you know that work is ongoing to see what we need to do um, to improve the situation um, in terms of short-term lets. Okay, and I think that, that um, what we have done here is, is put in place, we, we're making that distinction clear um, in this, that there's a difference between a private tenancy and a short-term let, which I thought would be something that Mr Whiteman would be glad of, considering that he has uh, 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 gone uh, to some lengths to say that there is a distinct difference. Uh, yes, there is, and I, I see the language, and it's useful. I mean, I'm just wondering what would happen to um, a property that where the owner is, I don't know, working offshore or working in the Middle East and is absent for four or five months of the year and rents the house as a holiday let for the rest of the year. Would that be subject to the repairing standard or uh, not? Convener, it's very difficult for me to give uh, an answer to a hypothetical question when I don't know what the agreement between the owner um, and a possible tenant or a possible um, holiday maker um, actually is. <coughs> um, if it is a tenancy, um, then it would have to meet the repairing standards. Um, if it's a short-term let, um, uh, then that has to uh, comply with other regimes. And, and as I say, that's something that we're looking at in depth, those other regimes. Okay. So that makes sense. So if there is a tenancy in place, for even if part of the year will have to meet the repairing standard? If it was a tenancy, um, yeah. it would have to meet the yeah. repairing standard, okay. yes. Okay, <coughs> Graham, you wanted to go yeah, um, I, I think all of this make, makes sense, Minister. Um, I just wanted to ask about the, the bit about safe kitchens and what the background to that is, um, because it inserts a new new element to have safely accessible food storage and food preparation space, which to me means, or could mean a, a fridge, a cupboard, and a work workspace to prepare food. Um, so, so what evidence has uh, led, you, led you to this? Um, there have been situations, um, convener, where uh, we know that people have uh, had tenancies which have not had adequate kitchen space. Um, this is uh, making sure uh, that all tenancies have that. Um, in terms of the detail of uh, what is required uh, to create a safe kitchen, um, we will lay that down um, in guidance. Um, I'm quite happy um, to share the guidance as we move forward uh, so that the committee uh, can see for themselves um, exactly what we are proposing. Um, but we um, are countering, um, and they are a small minority of cases, um, but cases where folks have not got the right facilities mm. in a home that they're renting, we believe that they should have these facilities, uh, and that's why we're moving forward in that front. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, in that case, I'll move on to agenda item four, a formal consideration of motion S5M 15439, calling for the Local Government and Communities Committee to recommend approval of the Draft Housing Scotland Act 2006, Supplemental Provision, Order 2019. I invite the Minister to speak and move this motion. I'll just move the motion, please, Convener. Thank you very much. Any con contributions from members? No. In that case, I invite you to sum up 
And there's nothing to sell uh, up. Uh, nothing to sell up, you. Convener. So therefore the question is that motion S5M 15439 in name of the Minister for Local Government, Housing and Planning be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the motion is agreed unanimously. The committee will report on the outcome of this instrument in due course. Agenda item 5 is consideration of motion S5M 15441 calling for the Local Government Communities Committee to recommend an approval of the Draft Housing Scotland Act 2006 modification of the Repairing Standard Regulations 2019. Once again, may I remind everyone that only the Minister and members may speak in this debate, uh, and I invite the Minister to speak and move the motion. I'll, I'll formally move the motion, Convener. Thank you very much. That, in that case, the question is that motion S5M 15441, in name of the Minister for Local Government, Housing and Planning, be approved. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Okay, and are we happy to delegate authority to me as convener to whatever? Yeah. <laughs> Approve the report. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, okay, yeah, no bother. The committee will report on this outcome uh, of the instrument also in due course. And that takes us to the end of this session. I want to thank the minister, particularly given his <coughs> cold or whatever it may be. It's coming to And uh, I'll suspend the meeting to change what is this? The consideration of public petition PE1688 on homelessness crisis in Scotland by Sean Clark and, Clark and calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to front load £40 million or £50 million from the Ending Homelessness Together Fund allocated for the core homeless over the next five years to be used in the next year to build new homes and refurbish existing properties so that the core homeless have safe, secure and comfortable homes in tandem with support services and an expanded first housing first policy. We last considered this petition at our meeting on 21st of November 2018 and agreed to write to the Scottish Government to seek its views on issues raised in the petition. A response has now been re received from the Scottish Government as well as a written submission from the petitioner and these are included in our meeting papers. Do members have any views? Yes, well, thanks, Computer. Um, I uh, have read with interest the note by the clerk uh, and I think that sets out the background to the petition very clearly and, and all relevant developments. Um, I note that the petition was lodged on the 7th of March 2018. And I note uh, that since that time, in fact, there have been a number of developments. Um, so we've had the Housing and Rough Sleepers Action Group, HARSAG's publication of their 70 recommendations, I think, in June 2018. We had the Scottish Government uh, set out their plans for the High Level Action Plan, uh, setting out in detail the actions to be taken forward uh, further to the 70 recommendations, also, of course, working in partnership <coughs> with uh, local government. Uh, and those, uh, high, that High Level Action Plan was published, I think, in November 2018. So from the time of the petition being lodged in March 18, there have, in fact, uh, been a number of developments uh, taken by the and uh, initiatives taken by the Scottish Government. Um, I know from the papers that the Scottish Government does not support the petition. The Scottish Government feels that its approach has set forth uh, further to these recent developments, including the £50 million fund over five years with a £23.5 million pounds, uh, from that fund, together with a, a smaller amount coming from the health portfolio, uh, so amounting in total to 23.5 million uh, has been allocated for rapid rehousing and housing first and indeed the housing first pledge has been made um, so i think it, it and finally i would say also that it appears that the petition is not supported by uh, uh, the scottish Feder federation of housing associations nor by the glasgow and west of scotland forum of housing associations and they make specific comments on it um, so my view would be taking into account all of these uh, factors uh, uh, which 
to be fair to the petitioner, the petitioner you know, came forward with ideas. They have been considered. A different route has been proposed by the Scottish Government. But I think taking up many of the, 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 the feelings that led the petitioner to, to, make, to, to lodge the petition, so I feel, therefore, that in the circumstances, it, perhaps events really have overtaken the petitioner's uh, objectives. Uh, and therefore, my view would be that the petition should be closed. But obviously, this committee, with its keen interest on homelessness issues and work that it has done to date, should continue to take a very close view uh, on the actions as they roll out and what the Scottish Government is doing. Uh, and I'm sure the committee will continue to, to keep that under very close uh, scrutiny. So I would suggest that we therefore close this petition. OK, thank you very much. Does anybody else? Andy, you have comments? Uh, yes, thanks, convener. I, mean, I broadly ag agree with um, Annabel Ewing. The, the, the papers, the petitioner, are all set out in the public domain and the um, uh, Glasgow and West of Scotland Federation of Housing Associations, Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, uh, and the government have all made their views clear. Our job as a committee is to look at the evidence in front of us, and it, I'm not persuaded that um, homelessness would be better tackled by front-loading 40 million of, or 50 million. I haven't <coughs> seen a, a route to doing that effectively. Um, I commend the petitioner for bringing this forward because I think the urgency of the uh, homelessness crisis we're facing uh, is very, very real, um, and I think that was reflected in the inquiry that this committee undertook uh, into the topic um, last year. Uh, and it is a matter of regret, but nevertheless, um, fact, uh, reality, uh, that a lot of the proposals that are um, put forward in the, in the government's uh, homelessness task force are not proposals that can be instantly uh, implemented. They will take a bit of time, and that's just an unfortunate uh, fact. Um, so I'm inclined to agree with uh, Annabelle Ewing that we should, um, uh, I think, probably, I'm not sure if we have the power to close this position or whether we would recommend to the petitions committee that they close the petition, but um, whatever way that our, our our work on this petition, I don't think there's much to be gained by um, taking it any further. Okay, thank you. Uh, the power rests with us to close the petition because it was handed on to us. Does anybody else have any views or comments they'd like to make? Are the views of the committee members similar to what have been heard here? So uh, is there anybody who's not minded to close the petition then? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, given uh, what I've heard from the, the committee, it's clear that there's a, a un unanimous decision to close the petition, but it's clearly on the grounds that the Scottish Government has made its petition clear, doesn't support the policy set, set out in the petition, also has its own preferred approach in the matter. It's set out clearly in the letter that the, the Minister sent to the committee. I do think that we should uh, commend the petitioner for raising this issue, first of all, with the petition committee and, and uh, and then further with us, but uh, as the committee has made itself clear, I think things have moved on from then. We will be keeping a very close eye on the homelessness situation and hoping to see improvements on it over the next year or so. Uh, in that case, that concludes the public part of today's meeting, and I move the meeting into private. Thank you.